August 17, 1976 is an infamous date in Shoshone County history. A 2 a.m. Osborne Police Department officer Chuck Ashton would spot a wrong way driver traveling westbound in the eastbound lanes of I-90 while driving home after his shift. Still in the uniform that he had been issued only five months prior when he first joined the police force, Officer Ashton placed a magnetic light on top of his car and started after the truck that was barreling toward oncoming traffic. Once stopped, Officer Ashton would radio out the license plate and description of the truck and request a Shoshone County deputy for assistance. That radio transmission would be the final communication from Officer Ashton, just moments before he'd be shot and killed. Osborne is a small town by most people's standards. At the time of the 1970 census, Osborne held a population of 2,248. Most times the town was fairly quiet aside from the freeway running through town. I-90 being one of the largest interstate highways in the U.S. sees immense daily travel numbers. The roadway cuts directly through North Idaho and the Silver Valley, often splitting straight through the center of the small towns that dot it. The constant stream of traffic brings both commerce and criminality, as folks would stop off for food, drinks, fuel, or rooms to rent both hourly or daily. The freeway also brought many from outside the valley in for work in the area's booming mining industry. Although not a miner himself, Officer Ashton would travel the route daily from his home in Post Falls to Osborne, where as of March 1st, he was a patrol officer for the Osborne Police Department. Ultimately having eyes for a patrol position with a bigger city department, he saw Osborne as a great starting point. In conversations with his California residing sister, he spoke about wanting to join the LAPD in the future, an idea she pushed back on telling him, you're crazy, you could get yourself killed in Los Angeles. The ambitious 23-year-old would proudly don the uniform each day, kiss his daughter and pregnant wife goodbye, and make the 40-mile trip to serve and protect the citizens of Osborne. His August 17th shift would start no differently. Dixon Douglas Curley grew up in St. Ignatius, Montana, a small town on the Flathead Reservation. One of eight children and numerous cousins in a tight-knit family, Curley would regularly find himself in trouble at a young age. By age 18 in 1971, he had been arrested and charged with first-degree larceny, burglary, and second-degree assault for a Christmas Day break-in to Bix Quality Market in St. Ignatius and a gun theft from a truck in Rivoli. As the jury was being selected for trial on the charges, Curley managed to strike a plea deal with prosecutors. He entered a guilty plea on the burglary and larceny charges, and in turn, the assault charge was dropped. The now 19-year-old would be sentenced to seven years, five for larceny, two for burglary. However, the sentences would run concurrently, setting his release for only five years in the future. Had he served the full five years, he would have still been incarcerated on August 17, 1976. However, he was released early. Shortly after his release, he was arrested in Plains, Montana on June 27, 1976 for charges of possession of more than 60 grams of marijuana. He was released on July 13 after posting his $2,000 cash bail. Two weeks later, he was due back in court but requested an extension to allow more time for him to seek a lawyer. This was granted and a new court date of August 10th was set. On August 6th, Curley was involved in a hit and run accident and when he failed to appear for his court date on the 10th, a warrant was issued for his arrest. He fled the area, and by the night of August 16th, he was hiding out in Shoshone County, just over the Montana border. As he drove around in his truck that night, his only passengers were a 30-30 rifle, a few joints, and a couple cases of beer, with a pile of empties growing on the floorboard. Around 2 a.m. on the 17th, Officer Ashton's shift was coming to a close. As he began the approximately 40 mile trip home, he was startled to spot a truck traveling west in the eastbound lanes of traffic, a recipe for disaster for anyone oncoming. He immediately radioed it into the Shoshone County Sheriff's Dispatch and crossed over to pursue the truck. The truck would finally come to a stop about 15 miles from Osborne, outside of Big Creek. As the truck stopped, Ashton would radio again, this time providing the license plate number and requesting a sheriff's deputy to respond. Officer Ashton then approached the vehicle. As he neared the driver's window, a rifle barrel is leveled at him in an instant. He quickly tries to push it away, but a single shot is fired before he can complete the motion. The 160 grain bullet would pass through his extended right hand, glance off the edge of his vest, and enter near his left collarbone, killing him likely almost instantly, leaving two children fatherless and turning a wife to a widow.
Several minutes later, responding deputies would find Ashton's lifeless body, but the truck was nowhere in sight. An examination of Ashton's gun would confirm the obvious. He never had a chance to draw it, let alone return fire. They would relay this information to dispatch, who in turn would notify all surrounding agencies, sending the local law enforcement into a frenzy and igniting a massive manhunt for the shooter. Officer Ashton's last radio transmission would provide the information necessary to ID his killer, and almost immediately after the shooting, officers knew they were looking for Dixon Curley. It would take nearly an hour for police to spot his truck on a frontage road near the bottom of the 4th of July Pass, but as a deputy attempted to stop Curley, he jumped out of his truck, gun in hand, and fled into the darkness outside of Rose Lake. Knowing he wouldn't make it far on foot, officers would flood the area, using everything possible to track him. Officers and deputies from the Idaho State Police in both Shoshone and Kootenai counties combed the surrounding areas aided by bloodhounds until the early morning light made it possible to add air support to the search. Both a fixed-wing aircraft and a helicopter searched the fields and meadows nearby while the ground search continued. After nearly seven hours of search, they'd catch a break. A local resident called into dispatch, saying they'd seen a man running through a nearby field carrying a rifle. Law enforcement flocked to the area and quickly located their target. Dixon Douglas Curley was taken into custody just after 9.30, and the newsmen present when he was led back to the squad car would note he was bleeding profusely from injuries to his face. Curley would be transported back to Wallace, where he was held without bail to Shoshone County Jail to await trial for charges of first-degree murder, a charge that under a 1973 law guaranteed the death penalty should he be convicted. This law, while seeming definite, was actually already on shaky ground. More on that momentarily. Curley would be appointed a public defender for his trial, and after only a handful of delays, the trial was set to proceed in February of 1977. The pretrial motions were handled barring any journalist or spectator to keep the jury pool as unbiased as possible given the circumstances. A few days after Curley was taken into custody, tragedy would nearly strike Shoshone County law enforcement a second time. On the evening of August 25th, little more than a week after Officer Ashton slaying, Wallace Police Department Officer Richard Wheatman would respond to a report that youngsters were throwing rocks. While the officer was looking for the purported miscreants, a single shot would be fired at him from across the narrow Coeur d'Alene River. The bullet would strike him in the chest, but his badge would save his life. The bullet would leave a dent large enough to fit a little finger in, but fate would spare the small town policeman, who fired a single shot back into the darkness he'd been shot from. Despite an immediate search of the area, no perpetrator could be found and the case would run cold. Although likely entirely unrelated to Curley's incarceration, this event would increase the tension surrounding the alleged cop killer's trial. On the morning of February 15, 1977, 80 prospective jurors were gathered for selection at the Shoshone County Courthouse. The group was whittled down until they reached the final 12, the nine men and three women from Shoshone County that would decide the guilt of the 24-year-old. As opening arguments began, the defense would take an interesting route. They admitted Curley was the one that had fired the shot that killed Officer Ashton, but that he was too inebriated at the time to have premeditated the act. The prosecution would hold firm that his actions were malicious and preplanned. The trial lasted only a few days. Curley would take the stand in his own defense, where he testified that he had been smoking marijuana all night and had drank more than 24 beers prior to being stopped that night. He claimed he didn't remember anything from the night leading up to the shooting, nor did he remember firing his rifle at the officer, but stated, right after I took off, I think I realized I hurt somebody bad. The prosecution would call one of the investigating deputies who had interviewed Curley when he was returned to Wallace. The deputy had taped the interview and the audio was played for the jurors. In the recording made soon after his capture, Curley laments, I wish I'd shot myself instead of that cop, I wish I was dead. And when asked about the events, he told investigators, an officer walked up, and I shot him, I guess. The trial would conclude that Friday, the 18th, and after deliberation, the jury would return a resounding guilty verdict. Curley openly wept in the courtroom while the jury was pulled, seemingly sealing his fate. A month later, on March 22nd, 1977, First District Court Judge James J. Towles would sentence Curley to death by hanging for the murder of Officer Chuck Ashton. The date was set for May 18th, but everybody present was aware it would be delayed by inevitable appeals. The judge himself would admit the 1973 law he had to sentence Curley under was likely unconstitutional per the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in the 1976 case of Woodson v. North Carolina. 
James Tyrone Woodson was involved in an armed robbery where the cashier was murdered. Woodson himself was not the one that killed the cashier, but was charged with first degree murder for his involvement regardless. North Carolina's law guiding sentencing was nearly identical to Idaho's. Anyone convicted of first degree murder was guaranteed a death sentence. This case found its way to the highest court in the country, and in their decision the Supreme Court would determine such laws were a violation of the Eighth Amendment. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. This decision wasn't due to the nature of the death penalty itself, but for the failure to note any mitigating or aggravating factors that may exist. In its ruling, the court would state that the law in question impermissibly treats all persons convicted of a designated offense not as uniquely individual human beings, but as members of a faceless, undifferentiated mass to be subjected to the blind infliction of the death penalty. This ruling came July 2, 1976, well before the trial and sentencing of Dixon Curley. But the slow pace of the state legislature left the judge with no choice but to sentence him under the existing law. At the time of sentencing, a revised law had been passed the legislature, but was awaiting Governor John Evans' signature. Despite daily phone calls from the prosecuting attorneys, the bill wouldn't be signed until a few days after Curley was sentenced to death. Judge Towles would note during sentencing, there are no mitigating factors in this case, a reference to the new law's guidelines for death sentences. Curley's attorney would appeal the case up to the state Supreme Court, where they would ultimately decide that while he had been sentenced to death under an unconstitutional law, he could also not be sentenced to death under the new law that had been signed after his conviction and remanded the case back to Judge Towles for resentencing. With no other choice, the judge resentenced him to a fixed term of 25 years, noting it guaranteed he'd be in prison for at least 8 more years as opposed to an indeterminate sentence not to exceed life, which could have seen him released even sooner. After more than two years on death row and in solitary confinement, Curley was returned to the state penitentiary to serve out the remaining 22 years of his sentence. In spite of his initial sentence to hang, Curley was discharged June 9, 1993, just shy of 17 years after gunning down Officer Ashton, much to the disdain of the officer's family and the local community. The previously forsaken man made little of his second chance at life and has spent the years since in and out of jail on charges ranging from multiple DUIs, probation violations, and drug charges to more violent offenses, though none compared to his actions that August night. While my research has failed to return an answer as to whether Curley is still breathing, I can tell you with certainty that Officer Ashton's memories lived on. I have found numerous posts from family members, folks from the local community, and law enforcement officers that had the pleasure of working alongside Chuck in his short tenure at the Osborne PD. He joins a depressingly long list of brave men and women killed in the line of duty and in such a senseless manner. Had Curley not fired his weapon, he likely would have been arrested and served time for the current open cases he had, as well as the wrong way driving and DUI that night but almost definitely would have been released long before the 17 years he ultimately served for the murder. His cowardly actions bought him seven hours of worthless evasion in trade for 17 years of his own life and the entirety of Officer Ashton's.